See, I'm wearing my cranky pants. I apologize for any glare off my glasses today. I just couldn't be bothered with anything like putting my contacts in and it's late now and I'm just feeling lazy, but I did want to try and get this video done. Uh, we're here to talk about We Contain Multitudes, which is a YA novel. Um, I would hold it up and show it to you, but <clears throat> my daughter has it now. She's reading it now. So let's talk about it because uh, I have a lot of feelings about it and another sort of tangential thing to discuss in regards to it. But we'll start with the book. The book is a YA drama about uh, two high school boys, one in 10th grade and one repeating his senior year and uh, their English teacher has them sending like letters to one another in kind of a pen pal assignment. Um, so Jonathan, who is the 10th grader, is this Walt Whitman um, fan uh, and he dresses in vintage clothing to look kind of like Walt Whitman, I guess. And he's gay. I wouldn't say he's he's out and proud because he's not particularly proud. He just is what he is. He's the target of bullies. Um, meanwhile, the the senior who again he's like repeating his senior year uh curl adam kurlansky everybody calls him curl he's a football player big guy from a polish family um he works with his family uh, in a roofing business so two very different characters ostensibly um and they're writing letters to one another so the the novel is epistolary in format meaning it's in the form of the letters back and forth, um, which ceases to work at some point, um, but we'll discuss that uh, in a little bit. So uh, over the course of the, the, the book, and this is not really a spoiler because I think it says it in the write-up, um, they fall in love and um, meanwhile they're both having various family dramas and and stuff as well as the relationship drama. So um, when I started the book I didn't actually like it very much because I didn't like either character uh, and then as the letters went on I started to like them more. I will say I didn't find their voices as distinctly different as I would have liked. Um, but that's uh, like I think a personal thing. I'm sure plenty of people would find them distinct but for me like there were times when I had to go back to the salutation of the letter to remember who was writing to who because to me they sounded enough alike that I couldn't just tell if I got lost in the middle of a letter who was talking to who anymore. Um, the other kind of clunky mechanics of the letter writing thing is that at the point when the two main characters are spending a lot of time together in order for the uh, reader to know what's going on, they have to write to each other basically what happened even though the other one was there. And that's kind of weird, you know? Um, they, they kind of try to pass it off with this, I know it's weird that I'm writing this to you because you were there, but you said this and I did this. And I'm kind of like, yeah, it. there are times when you can get away with it, but not all the time and so much of this book is them rehashing things they were both there for uh, a lot <laughs> um, and it just doesn't have a natural flow for me. Um, there's a little bit of squeamish... I, I don't want to say squeamishness. Um, so Jonathan is 15 and Carl is 18 and um, they start having this sexual relationship so there's obviously some underage sex happening here and also just like um, I know 15 and 18 doesn't seem like a big age gap but at the same time I feel like you're very different from 15 to like a lot you change a lot <laughs> in those years and I, I I put this in my blog post if you want to go read 
my blog post review of this book, you can. I'll link it below. But um, I, I get, you know, maybe we're supposed to believe Jonathan's kind of mature for his age and Curl is as having to repeat, you know, his senior year, um, not as mature as he should be for 18. I mean, like maybe we're supposed to believe that somehow it's okay. There are also a couple moments in this book where consent is kind of questionable and doesn't really get fully addressed. So there are some issues, potential issues there as well. I gave the book three stars on Goodreads maybe even three and a half. I, I, I didn't like it and then I did and then somewhere between the like around the 50-60% mark it, it kind of went off the rails for me um, just because it slid into just such teenage drama and then the ending I won't spoil anything but it, for me it, it didn't stick the landing. Um, but again it's all very subjective. Uh, a lot of people seem to have liked it and then just as many people from the reviews I read uh, didn't. And so what I, I kind of wanted to talk about uh, in tandem with this book review is about the idea of who gets to write certain stories and what the audience is for some stories. And this is gonna get um, a little bit... Okay, so... <laughs> A lot of criticism comes at the author of this book for being a woman writing gay teens. Um, obviously it's not an own voices book um, and it doesn't get you know presented as such but there are people who are like this is a terrible uh, example for uh, young adult gay you know teens to be reading and um, I don't know if that's true my daughter uh, identifies as queer and I, I I read this book to vet it before letting her read it and you know I was fine with it I was like you know yeah there's some sex in here and stuff but you know I think you're okay um but again she's also not a gay guy she's a girl um so <laughs> uh, I as an author I write um, gay relationships in some of my books um, and I always I am so I'm biased but I always get a little bit kind of grumbly about the idea that there are some some things I'm not allowed to write um, I can write I think whatever I want I think I think the important thing is to approach the subject matter with respect and sensitivity and um, with the audience in mind and then I like to think that the market kind of takes care of the rest. And, uh, you know, if I do it well, people will read it and like it and the book will do well. And if I do it badly, then, you know, the book will do badly and, and deservedly so. Um, I know that's not always the case. Sometimes really crappy stuff gets super promoted. Um, it is still... <laughs> A business uh, I mean this is a capitalist society after all and people get hurt in capitalist societies um, whole groups of people get hurt um, and so that's kind of where I go into the the marketing thing um, so so often whenever we read something like a male male romance or something like that um, there's this idea that this is supposed to be representation for uh, gay people, queer people to identify with. And I think there should be more of that out there. I think there should be more own voices. I think there should be, I think we should have content coming from those creators. Um, but I think a lot of times the audience for a lot of this stuff is not the actual like gay community i think i okay so i have a <laughs> so i have a background in um fan psychology it's something i studied as an undergrad it was kind of my one of my specialty concentrations and so you know we know that most uh slash 
fan fiction is written by heterosexual women and read by heterosexual women. It's not written for the gay community or whatever. Um, and I think in some cases what we're getting is a lot of YA that <laughs> is actually the market is starting to be like older people or we're getting like gay stories that are still being read mostly by straight people. Um, I think unfortunately there's a lot of times a voyeuristic aspect to it that kind of is ew. Um, but I do think when publishing is putting out these books, um, maybe they do think sometimes that, oh, this is going to be a great book for like the LGBT, you know, young adult community. And then it gets picked up by some other group of readers. It does well, but not with that market, but with this other market. And you see it in movies too, where you get these cult classics where they get put out for a certain group and that group rejects it. Um, you know, oh, this action movie is actually horrible. But then like some other group who enjoys camp or whatever picks it up and makes it a cult classic. And I think the same thing happens sometimes with books where it's put out with this idea that it's for this audience and yet it's another audience that picks it up and makes it its own. Um, I wouldn't necessarily like we contain multitudes, I wouldn't necessarily say is, I don't know who's reading that. <laughs> I really don't. Um, it seems to be a wide spectrum of people. Um, the, the teen sex stuff, like again, there might be a voyeuristic um, audience for that that kind of is like, um, I don't know that uh, gay teens would read it and say, oh yeah, I completely identify with this experience. But at the sa same time, they don't also necessarily identify with Riverdale, but they watch it. So, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, um, it, you know, I don't think you can necessarily always expect every book to be, um, realistic in its depictions. This is this is melodrama, really. This this book lays it on pretty thick towards the end with everything that's going on in it. And um, and so I guess what I'm trying to say is uh, I think authors should be able to write, you know, what what they're going to write. I don't believe they should be able to write things that are harmful to certain groups. I think they should write with sensitivity and respect and do their due diligence. Um, but I also think that sometimes their audience is not, they may be writing a, a certain kind of character, but their audience is not the same as those characters. Their audience is actually something else. Like you can write gay characters and your audience be not a gay community and like um I did that doesn't mean like gay people shouldn't read those books I'm just saying I don't think that those those kinds of things should be judged on their representation of oh, this sounds terrible like I'm like I'm listening to myself I'm like this, this isn't coming out the way I want it to and um I've already tried to make this video like once before but like <laughs> It's complicated. It's a complicated like network of, you know, who's writing for who and what the market will allow. And um, the bo at the bottom, the bottom line is publishing is, is a business. And as long as they think it'll sell, they don't care who it sells to. They don't. They only care that they're going to move copies of books. Um, and I think what we need are readers who demand more from their books, you know, um, a little more discernment or a little more, you know, like a little more of the own voices and more of the, the, you know, more stuff for those audiences as opposed to letting people like, people like me who write, 
admittedly, like, you know, um, I, I have a gay spy novel and I have a gay, like, historical romance. And you know what? The gay historical romance didn't do as well. And possibly rightly so, because historical romance tends to go towards the sweet and clean and tends to have a more conservative audience. And they did not accept the, the gay relationship in that book as well as they had my sweet, clean other historical romance that had heterosexual uh, couples in them. So, you know, I'm like, okay, that's the market. Um, I'm not sorry I wrote the book that I wrote or published the book that I published. I think I, you know, I enjoyed writing it. I, and I'm glad that at least a few people out there have enjoyed it, but I do understand that the market and that audience um, did reject it to some extent. Um, and the gay spy novel, which is just like, again, the kinds of people who read spy novels are maybe not the kinds of people who want to see like gay main characters. And, you know, I, again, I understood that going in. Um, I wrote it anyway, because I wrote it the way I wanted to. Um, that's the joy of being an indie author. Um, but like for, uh, for, um, the industry and for traditional publishing, I think, you know, it gets a little foggier. They put out a book because they, they honestly, they honestly think when they're putting out the book, this is good or this is good representation or yay, we've got another, maybe they're just trying to tick the boxes and say, we've got this many, you know, LGBTQIA plus books um, out this, you know, season and yay us or, you know, I mean, it could be any number of things. Um, you know, they, they're trying to meet quotas and stuff and they don't care who wrote the book or, you know, and again, they don't really care who, I mean, they care who it's for in a marketing sense. They need to know who they're marketing to, but at the same time, as long as the book does it well, they don't care who's actually buying it at the end of the day. And, um, yeah <laughs> i don't know if that made any sense i'm sorry uh it's late and i'm tired but <laughs> i do think authors should be allowed to write what they're gonna write so long as it's not hurting anybody um and then the people who don't like it are allowed to say i didn't like it and here's why here's everything i, I find wrong with it but then you know if some people like it if it finds an audience over here instead of over there then okay that's you know that's the market um and uh yeah i mean the, I, the audiences are constantly in flux and um sometimes the people you thought were gonna buy the book are not the people who buy the book <laughs> it, it ends up being a, whole, a completely different group of people who who fall in with it and like it's up to, to marketing to figure out why that is. Like, why did this not do well with the group we thought we were selling to? Why did instead these people choose to read it? Um, which is, you know, a whole other interesting, you know, thing. I don't, I don't have data on who read We Contain Multitudes, um, who's, who it sold to or, or who it was aimed at. Um, you know, it's YA, so it's shelved in the YA section, but it, we know that a lot of adults are reading YA now. So, I don't know. Um, I read some YA, obviously. Um, a lot of people do. I, like I said, I often vet some of it before my kids read it, but sometimes I read it just because I want to. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just always like, who wrote the book? Like, where is this book coming from? And then who is it for? And those are two questions that we kind of need to answer every time, right? <laughs> like, is this own voices or is this just fiction? Um, um, because I think, you know, own voices imbues the fiction with some authenticity that pure fiction doesn't carry. Um, and that isn't to say that pure fiction shouldn't have, again, some kind of authentic basis or at the very least some kind of understanding of the subject matter. But again, like look at, look at so many like of these teen uh, TV shows and, and things and you're like, yeah, there's no reality in that. Um, 
It's it's all it's pure soap. Uh and yeah. Okay. <laughs> Again, I'm sorry if that didn't make any sense. Um feel free to leave a comment if you have a question about something I said or you need me to clarify something because I am not articulating it as well as I would like to. Um, and this is why I'm a writer and not a speaker a lot of the time. But, um, yeah. So, anyway, the book was okay. I mean, I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. Um, I can see why people found certain things problematic. Um, and, uh, but I'm still, you know, I'm still gonna let my daughter read it. So, like, I, it's not, like, so horrific that I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Um, there will be some stuff to talk about, probably after she reads it, you know, the consent issues and, um, and things like that. But, uh, sometimes that's, that's good. That's a good jumping off point for discussions like that sometimes. So, you know, even, even subpar books can be, can be useful <laughs> in some ways. Um, and that's everything. And I will be back here with my son to do the Merlin part two video soon. So stay tuned for that. And I will see you next time.